Retro Rewind, harnessing 80s pop culture wisdom and life lessons for today's leadership with Chris Clues. Join us on a journey back in time with 80s pop culture expert, Chris Clues. This is, isn't just a nostalgic trip, it's a deep dive into the hidden leadership and life lessons from our favorite 80s movies. Unearth problem-solving wisdom from the Frog Brothers. Trust from Caddyshack. Diversity appreciation from the Breakfast Club. Audience understanding from Clark Griswold. Work-life balance from Ferris Bruller. Stress management from Mr. Miyagi. And the art of risk-taking from Ghostbusters. We'll also explore powerful themes like social responsibility from E.T., Moral leadership from the outsiders, earned leadership from Prince Akeem, leadership versus rulership from Prince, and team protection from Axel Folly. But that's not all. We're also delving into life lessons on individuality, defining success, and chasing dreams. So buckle up for a wisdom packed journey through time. Welcome to the Wellness Driven Life Show where you're about to go on a wellness-driven ride. I'm excited to introduce our guest to you today. Chris Clues is a speaker and author known for his book series that combines 80s pop culture with work and life lessons. With over 20 years in corporate marketing, he's spoken at organizations like Visa, DHL, and the University of Florida, and frequently appears on podcasts. He's been cited in Entrepreneur.com and Esquire UK Magazine. A graduate of Elon University, Clues has led marketing for companies like Planet Hollywood and DHL and managed various sports sponsorships. He supports Animal Rescue, donating part of his proceeds to Wonder Paws Rescue. Please help me welcome Chris Clues. Hey, April. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey, Chris. It's awesome to have you. And look, you brought back a video store. I did. Blockbuster. Yeah, this actually, uh, when uh, all the physical speaking uh, stages shut down uh, with COVID in March of 2020, I needed something for virtual speaking that fit uh, my content. And I happened to have been to the last Blockbuster on Earth in Bend, Oregon on, in September of 2019. And I had this picture that I had taken and I was like, this is perfect. I can even almost like walk back and grab a, a movie off the shelf. It is so perfect. Thank you so much for bringing that back to us. I know for me, it has, it, that was one of the biggest challenges and frustrations because it was the best thing on a Friday night to go to a blockbuster, pick out a movie, get a pizza, pick out a candy bar or whatever. Not like those are healthy things on the wellness driven life show, <laughs> but it was a part of growing up and there was so much magic involved in it. Yeah. Mine was the Mike and Ike's. Uh, that was my, my candy of choice, but yeah, I definitely think obviously having things at our fingertips and being able to watch whatever we want to watch whenever we want to watch it is, is it's a nice thing to have. It's a very nice convenience. I wouldn't say that it isn't. However, I do think that there is a bit of romanticism in this idea that we didn't have everything at our fingertips. We had to go to Blockbuster on a Friday night and hope that the movie that we wanted was there. It's still and, there. <laughs> right. Yeah. And if it wasn't, you know, we would wait by the return bin, hoping somebody was going to return it because maybe the person said who worked there was like, oh, we're expecting three copies in tonight. We just don't know when. So yeah. you'd hear that that return bin, somebody drop it in, you think is your movie. And and one other thing about that is that, you know, these algorithms that we have on Netflix and Amazon Prime and other streaming, 
platforms that are supposed to tell us, hey, if you like this, you might like that. I think the human algorithm at Blockbuster was better. If I was looking for a movie that wasn't there, you know, John or Sally in the Blockbuster video store and say, well, I, this isn't in, but you might like this one. And usually yeah. I did. Yeah. Yeah. That human interaction of recommendation. It was a, it was more of a fun experience. I agree with that where people got to give you their Intel and share their ideas about it and hopefully not giving away too much. That's never fun when somebody is, explaining the entire movie for you to not be excited about what's coming next because you already know what's coming next. But yeah, absolutely. You're bringing me da back down on memory lane, going back to those days when we did have those opportunities of rushing there first so we could get the movie before it's off the shelf. So let's start Chris, by taking people back to know a little bit more about you, can you share with the audience who you are? Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you again, April, for having me because it's, it's independent podcasters like you that give people like me a platform. And we didn't have this before. And so to be a, a guest is really easy. The work that you put into the show on the back end um, is a lot more, there's a lot more to it. It's a lot more challenging. So I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about myself. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah, thank absolutely. You. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm a keynote speaker and author, but I ha always have—I haven't always been. I was in corporate marketing for about 20 plus years, and uh, I listen. I enjoyed marketing. I still enjoy marketing, but I felt like there was something else out there for me. I just didn't know what it was, and so I was having a bit of a self pity party of one uh, on mm. my couch, and the Breakfast Club came on. And uh, Bender, now I knew every line in The Breakfast Club, but you know, you hear lines, but do you really listen to them? And this was the first time I listened to this line and it was Bender, actually my, my t-shirt here, Breakfast Club, it was Bender oh, over there. Uh, Brett Bender, <laughs> screws fall out all the time. The world's an imperfect place. My screws have fallen out. I was in an imperfect place and I suddenly I like shot up and I'm like, what am I going to do to fix this? Am I going to put those proverbial screws back in and just keep going down the same path, the same thing that's kind of got me in the self-pity party of one place as Henry David Thoreau said, not an eighties pop culture icon, more like 1840s said the mass of men. And today we'll call that the mass of people. The mass of people lead lives of quiet desperation. I was leading a life of quiet desperation. Uh, or was I going to get a whole new set of screws and a whole new door and walk out to an entirely new journey? And I decided that's what I was going to do. Now, what was that journey? Of course, I took the idea of screws falling out from the breakfast club. And I wrote a little article on what the breakfast club can teach us about problem solving mm. and people responded to it. I got a, re I got great feedback. I was actually shocked um, how much fee positive feedback I got from the article. And so then I took a step back and in the outsiders, uh, Johnny Cade, uh, who was played by Ralph Macchio, you know, the stay gold is what most people know from the outsiders. But he also said, you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. Mm -hmm. And I was 46 years old. I wasn't a spring chicken when it came to entrepreneurship, 46 years old, but I recognize I still have a lot of time to make myself be what I want. What is that thing? I was uh, working at DHL as the head of marketing for a division, you know, working a lot of hours, traveling a lot. I took time at night on weekends, the free time that I used to use to spend time with my friends. I was using to build this new thing, which was this idea of of uh, life and work lessons from 80s pop culture. I built my own website. I positioned myself as a speaker. I wrote a little book, the first book in my series, 60 pages. It's if you're a bathroom reader, a couple times in the bathroom, you're done. Um, but it's, it sent me on this journey and uh, I got hired to speak and uh, went from there. And so it was about 18 months of burning the candle at both ends. And then I came out on the other side and now have three books and I'm a keynote speaker, as you mentioned, I've spoken to a number of organizations and, and I just couldn't be happier. Well, I know, Chris, that my husband and I had the pleasure of speaking with you prior to you coming on the show. And you are such an inspiration to us, we got to say, because the 80s pop culture, that that time period was such a magical era in and of itself. And for you to be able to go into something professionally is awesome because you get to do something that's super, super fun and exciting. And not only that, but you, I, I feel that especially for people in my age group and maybe a little older, but it brings us back into like 
the 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 childhood or the teenage sort of years. And it, it's just, it's so fun. And so I think that it brings a lot of joy to others and yourself. And it's like, you keep doing that and cultivating that feeling of, of excitement and fun. So you've also been able to meet a lot of cool people along the way. <laughs> it makes yeah. sense to me that you've got a really good response from that, from, you know, because again, it, it brings a lot of memories and joy and people like to go back to that, like to go back to the times and the feelings that make them feel good. And what you specialize in is all of those things where you've really dived into all of the golden nuggets of the things being said, all of the wisdom from that era. Yeah. So I talk about 80s pop culture. I say it was kind of like somebody took a glitter bomb and threw it against the wall and all of these wonderful colors came out. And that was like the individuality and the creativity of the 80s. I, I, I may be a little biased because it was the time that I grew up in, but I do feel like there was never a decade before or after like the 80s in terms of the explosion of different types of pop culture, which leads us to so many opportunities for great lessons. And it's, I mean, you look at just like the music in the movies, not to go too deep into that, but the genres of music that came out in the eighties, it, it's like nothing we've ever seen before. If you think about, you know, hip hop and metal, for example, both of them had a little bit of, you know, I mean, you could go back to metal like black Sabbath and you had grandmaster flash on the hip hop side in the late seventies, but there really wasn't that much. And then all of a sudden in the eighties, it wasn't just that there was one metal genre and one hip hop genre. There were all these splinter genres underneath of each of them. And we mm. haven't even touched on like the alternative music and the different types of alternative music. There were all the, you know, from, from new wave to kind of goth and all everything in between. And so that's really what's cr created this, uh, this kind of explosion in different types of music. And what I challenge people to do is I say, go back to any week of any month of any year in the eighties, June, uh, the third week in June, 1984, go look at the top 40. You are going to see something for everybody. You'll have like Depeche Mode next to LO Cool J next to Motley Crue. We'll throw in some Depeche Mode and then some Kenny Rogers. Like it represented everything and every part of our society. And the same goes for movies. You had, you know, the rom-com really exploded in the 80s. Sure, you had some before, like Some Like It Hot. People don't forget that Marilyn Monroe, you know, as beautiful as she was, was also a great comedian. And if you go back and you watch some of her movies, she was really funny and she had great comedic timing and some like it hot was a great rom-com. And of course in the sixties and seventies, we had some, but the eighties is what people remember. They remember the rom-coms and the coming of age movies, uh, the slasher films, all of these things came out in the eighties and then just exploded from there on out. So um, there's a lot to pull from, from the eighties. And I think that's what excites me and why I find so many lessons in it. Yeah, I and you know, I think that it also has brought up a different type of culture. I'll, definitely the it is a bit different than it is throughout the generations. We are really whatever we expose ourselves to really helps cultivate who we are and how we show up in the world. That's right. Yeah, and and pop culture actually has a lot to do with that. Uh because so much of what we're influenced by when we're younger, uh, more so than even, you know, as we get older, of course, we, we, we still take in pop culture. But when we're younger, there, music has such an influence on us. Movies has such an influence on us, especially at a time when you're teenagers, when, you know, your, your parents, you look back and you think my parents had some really good influence on me. But at the time, you weren't paying attention to that. You, you were, you know, it was the music you were getting it from. It was the movies, it was the pop culture that was in front of you. That was kind of dictating to you who you wanted to be. I, I want to be more like this. I want to be more like that. I gravitate towards this group because they listen to this music or they watch these movies. Huge influence on who we actually become as young adults. And then it's up to us, of course, to decide like which of those influences was good and which maybe wasn't so good and make those, those choices. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I like to say that I feel like I was born a decade too late, but probably not. I enjoy the 80s time period so much. Sometimes I wonder if I'm stuck there. It's oftentimes 
the the music that I listen to. It's what I go out and seek the cover bands that we dance to, Depeche Mode, like you said, Motley Crue. It was just such a fun, fun time. And I think that it is incredibly fun to dance to. But I want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that yeah. you have found, because I know that you've got a plethora of them. I mean, you can pull from some of your writings or whatever you do, but I'd love to jump into those lessons a little bit. Yeah, sure. So we were just talking about music and the influence it has and how, you know, you, you love to dance to it and I love to listen to it. And so let's, let's focus on a musician. Uh, one that I would argue uh, is probably one of the most popular of all time. And, uh, Hundreds of years from now, well after we're gone, he will still have a major influence. Uh, anytime you're known by one name across the world, you've done something right. And this guy was a musician who loved the color purple, if that mm -hmm. gives it away. Prince, uh, for my money, uh, I would say he's a top five musician of all time. If, if you really want to dive into who he was beyond his music, you can see that the amount of instruments that he knew, the, the, the types of compositions that he did outside of pop music. Yeah. The, the, the music that he wrote for other people, like, you know, right. the Bangles, Manic Monday yeah. and Shaka Khan for Shaka Khan. Nothing compares to you. And I could go on and on about that. So he was uh, we say Michael Jackson was the king of pop. Prince was the king of music. And so in 1987, he was already remember, we saw what, 13, uh, 29 more years with him. He was just getting started and he'd already been one Grammy. He's been nominated for Academy Awards, did his own movie, Purple Rain. And Suzanne Vega in 1987 was an alt singer who I, I, I really enjoyed, but she was more on college radio. She had a song called Left of Center on the Pretty in Pink soundtrack. And then she came out with a song called My Name is Luca. Uh, I live on the second floor. I live upstairs from you. I, I'm not going to sing it, but you, you get the gist. And so this was the song that really put her on the map. But Prince heard the, the song and he was so moved by it that he actually penned a handwritten note to her. And if you Google, if you go and Google Prince and Suzanne Vega, you'll see this handwritten note. The note said, Dear Suzanne, Luke is the most compelling piece of music I've heard in a long time. There are no words to tell you all the things I feel when I hear it. I thank God for you, Prince. Mm. It's pretty awesome, right? And, and, and when you see the, the, the note, you're going to see the magical handwriting. And, and it's not surprising. He had this magical handwriting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So... We know this because when he passed away in 2016, Suzanne Vega put it on her social media to let people know the kind of guy he was behind the scenes. Now, what did he teach us with this simple handwritten note? Three things. The first is that leaders share the stage of success. Rulers keep everybody below the stage. Leaders share it. Rulers, when they get that mm -hmm. stage of success, they don't want to share it with anybody. They don't want anybody near them taking their spotlight like you stay down here. Leaders share the stage. They recognize greatness in other people and they want to share it and say, look, yeah. I see greatness in you and, I, and, and you, can, you can have part of this stage as well. The second thing is that encouragement doesn't cost a thing. We can all go out and encourage somebody today. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. You have somebody in your life that needs to be encouraged and, and, and it doesn't cost a thing to do it. And, and I can assure you that Suzanne Vega was, was likely very encouraged um, by this handwritten note from Prince. And the third is that the handwritten note is a lost art. It's nice to, you know, let people know via email that they did a great job. I mean, listen, praise is praise, but that handwritten note has a little more of your energy and your soul in it. And it does make a difference that 30 seconds of time you take to just do a handwritten note and you'll see it in Prince's mm -hmm. handwriting. You can feel his soul. You can feel his energy in it. And that's for all of us. Even somebody like me who has terrible handwriting, it still makes a difference. It does. It does. And, and you're right. These are all very powerful statements that have come from this one action, this, this, this action of love really, and being able to support other people and lifting them as they climb and supporting them just makes them want to do better themselves. And I think that it also sh definitely shows the message to continue doing that to others. I think that there's a very powerful aspect of that too, that as we continue to do well and encourage others to do well, it just, the, the rising tide lifts all ships, right? Yeah. yeah. And somebody else, you know, I mean, somebody encouraged you at some point 
And, uh, and then the more we encourage people that, that, yeah, you're right. It's just kind of like, remember, uh, was it hands across America, um, back in the eighties where they did, you know, did the whole thing about, I can't remember exactly what the cause was for, geez, but yeah, across, all the bands yeah. bought together. Well, the band, you had the bands with, uh, live aid and then yeah. you had, uh, also there was farm aid as well. Uh, and then the Christmas one, right? Do they know it's Christmas time at all? That one, but, but then there was hands across America where everybody was like, the idea was to build this big human chain around the country, all holding hands. And so, yeah, I mean, that's part, that's what happens when you encourage one person, they encourage the next and it, and it creates a chain of events, yeah. positive events. Yeah, absolutely. Well, have you had any of those experiences yourself? Can you ha give us some examples of things in your own life where you've felt that, experienced that, and continued that aspect? Yeah, I mean, ever since I was a kid, I would say, you know, in terms of encouragement, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, it's people who have encouraged you along the way yeah. and in turn encouraging others. And what kind of, what that has done for you, like what you've seen it do for yourself and for others. I, I wouldn't be doing what I do today, this 80s pop culture thing, if not for people encouraging me along the way. And that started from a very young age, you know, even even playing sports and failing and getting up, uh, trying something new uh, when it came to a sport. Um, those things prepared me for what I'm doing today, but only because there were people in my cor corner encouraging me and letting me know like that, you know, it's okay to, to go for this. Uh, I will tell you though, at, when you go out on your own as an entrepreneur, um, you really do find out who your friends are. And sometimes mm -hmm. you're surprised by the people that stand up in your corner. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times it's like somebody who you're, you know, you're friends with, it's an acquaintance, they're kind of in your circle, but man, you really find out who your supporters are and who are the people that are going to, push you and encourage you and are proud of you for just giving it a shot. Even if it doesn't work out, just the fact that, the, you know, that you're trying it. And I've, I've had that experience with people that just, you know, said, man, you know, I need to tell you this, like, it's so awesome what you're doing. And that, that little bit of encouragement is enough to get you through the next week. And then you get another little bit of encouragement through the next week. And cause it's, you know, when you're on your own, it's you're, you're on your own. And, uh, yeah. you have to rely on the encouragement of others to keep pushing you, even though, even if you're driven, uh, yeah. having encouragement from others is so important. I love your story of the pity party on your couch <laughs> and watching yeah. the movie and, you know, hearing that one word when you've, you've seen the movie, heard it a hundred times, but it just resonates in such a way that it inspires and motivates or it, it lights the flame within yeah. and, you're like, okay, I'm going to think about this a little more. And you're correct, Chris. Entrepreneurship is one of the most difficult things that people do. I was just talking about that with somebody earlier today. And it is something that really pushes you into a self-reflection sort of mode. I mean, you have to do everything for yourself. Um, although you shouldn't do it without the help of others, you know, it definitely makes it so much easier. I don't think that you can do it quite alone. However, in the beginning, it feels very alone and it feels like you're stepping off into a cliff, you know, off of it. <laughs> and it's, it's terrifying a little bit. You have to be the keeper of your own time, your own schedule, and you, it's a fire hose to the face. Yeah. And I've got two lessons um, and they're very short, but you know, just a, a couple of little scenes and, and, and lines that, that I kind of take and say, these are analogous to going out on your entrepreneurial journey. And so one is from field of dreams when Ray Kinsella, you know, played by Kevin Costner. And he's, he's basically destroyed a lot of the crop that ultimately would feed his family because he's heard these voices and <laughs> build it. Mm. If you build it, he will come. And, and anyway, you know, crazy, right? So he does this. And then once it's done and the lights are up and it looks beautiful, he and his wife, Annie are having this little like picnic in the middle of the, of the baseball diamond where there used to be corn to, you know, their crop. And he stands up and he says, I've, I've just done something totally illogical. And her first response to him is, it's a beautiful baseball diamond, right? And I think mm. like support, that's what we're talking about, right? He yeah. did do something really illogical, 
but she believed in him. She believed in whatever it was he was doing as crazy as it sounded. And that support, he could not have done that without that support. Yeah. And that's, that's a really important lesson. I mean, he, he basically, he built a baseball diamond, tore down the corn that fed their family, you know, in terms of like being able to sell it. And she said, it's a be- beautiful di- baseball diamond. Right. So that's number one. It's um, perspective support. too. I mean, it's perspective and it's, that. it's support. It's just, that support is so huge when you go out on your own, because it does feel crazy. Oftentimes it feels like this is nuts. Why am I doing this? <laughs> Um, you know, you left the perceived stability of the corporate world. And I say the perceived because people think, oh, the corporates, why would you leave the stability of the corporate world? Any Friday you could walk in and they could say, thanks a lot. Yeah. Whether you've been there for a year or 25 years, it's perceived yeah. stability, but nonetheless, people feel it's much more stable and it probably is. Uh, but then it's the second, consistent, you know, maybe, you know, it's consistent. It's consistent. With the paycheck yeah. and- That's right. Until it's not. Until it's not. Right. And yeah. so the second thing I would say is um, from Better Off Dead, which is just a cult classic from the 80s with John Cusack and, um, of course, uh, Curtis Armstrong, who, if you don't know him, he was Booger from Nerds, uh, from Revenge of the Nerds, Booger from <laughs> Revenge of the Nerds. And he plays he plays uh, John Cusack's best friend. So Lane Meyer is played by, uh, by John Cusack. And at one point when they're sitting up, and, I, and without getting too much into the plot, for those of you that may not have seen the movie, you know, Lane is trying to get his girlfriend back from the, you know, the kind of stud obnoxious sweater around the neck guy that every <laughs> yeah. 80s movie had. And so he's going to race this guy down the K-12, which is the big ski slope in their neighborhood, in their, in their uh, town. But he's it's never, like he's a, never done it like before. a double diamond or something, right? It's double black diamond. Nobody, black he's diamond. never done it before. And he's sitting at the top and he's got the skis. He's looking out over his skis, right? Over his skis. He's getting out over his skis. And, um, and his buddy, uh, played by Kermit Curtis Armstrong and his, my, his name is slipping my mind for whatever reason right now. Uh, Lane yeah. says, I don't know. I don't know what to do. And he says, you know, just look, just go that way really fast. And if something gets in your way, turn. And if that's not entrepreneurship, I mean, that is it. Like, just go that way really fast. If something gets in your way, turn. And sometimes you're going to smash right into it, but get up and find yeah. a different path. So. Yeah, Yeah. totally. And I hope this is inspiring you folks to go watch some 80s movies because Better Off Dead is definitely one of those classics. It's so fun. If you're if you want to just chill back and watch something that is jam packed full of not only humor, but also some wisdom. (laughs) Totally. I mean, all of them are like that, right? I mean, I think that's one of the things I enjoy the most is there was always a lot of humor, you know, where it was, it was light and it was fun. And some of it, you know, people now might be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they said that. But at the same time, why so serious? (laughs) Yeah. Why so serious? Yeah. You know, I mean, listen, every, every decade, it's going to have its things that that are going to be perceived to be or in reality are problematic uh, as we age and, and as we move into, you know, newer. De- I Listen, kids today, if you're listening, I can assure you 30 or 40 years from now, people will find some of the things that you thought funny um, objectionable. Yeah, um, that's just it, it's <laughs> how we it's what happens. Yeah. The question is, what can you learn from some of these great movies and the music, like where are the opportunities to find positivity? Where are the opportunities to find lessons, good and bad, by the way, what not to do and what to do. And uh, by the way, Charles DeMar was the name of, of his friend. Oh, you got uh, it. And better off dead. Uh, So yeah, for sure. Is he he the one who he always had the cigar in his mouth? Well, that was that was him in, uh, well, did he have a cigar in Risky Business? Because he was also in Risky Business. No, I'm uh, thinking of Scrooged. Oh, Scrooged, yes. He was no. a cab driver in Scrooged. Wasn't he in Better Off Was Dead? he really? I, if he was, that's a, that's a good pull because I didn't know that. Uh, I think so, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he played, no, he was like always, I think he had said like, do you, He's like, this mountain is pure snow. Do you know this? Do you know the value, the street value of this mountain? It's pure snow. Um, I think it's like, him. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it, it may be. I, I didn't know that. He has a book, actually. I think it's called Revenge of the Nerd or something like that. But um, but yeah, I mean, look, there's lessons everywhere in um, pop culture. Again, good and bad uh, for life yeah. and for work. And I just feel like 80s pop culture is just has this um, – I, I we've just scratched the surface in terms of what's kind of come back, what, what music's been – you know, looked at as uh, maybe music that they use for commercials, what movies have been remade, which I hate, um, which, which musicians and which movies have had influence from the eighties. I, I we're just scratching the surface. There's so much. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there's, there was so much like you described. It, it's like this, this uh, glitter bomb that just exploded. Right. So there's yeah. so much to play with and to grab from and recreate and, and, you know, to, to go on with all of the creation and creative minds that were happening during that time. So what, let's, let's grab a couple more lessons from you. What are some of your tops and some of your favorites? Yeah. So I'll go to one that everybody's, uh, actually we talked about the breakfast club a little bit. We'll come back to that. Uh, one that we I could really talk about the breakfast club for the whole show. I think I I'm sure we could, but we will <laughs> definitely get back to that. Cause there's some great lessons in there. And in my newest book, I have a lesson from every, uh, one of the five, uh, main characters nice. plus principal Vernon and Carl, the janitor each have a lesson for us as well. Um, can't forget those Carl, the janitor. I'm the eyes and ears of this institution. He's, he's yeah. great, great character. Um, so let's talk about a movie that may be one that doesn't roll off the tongue when it comes to, uh, movies that people say, oh, great 80s movie, but it is a great 80s movie. And it had Eddie Murphy, Dan Aykroyd, and Jamie Lee Curtis. If that's all I tell you, you should watch it. And it's called Trading Places. And uh, Trading Places, I mean, fantastic comedy with a lot of great um, social messages in it as well. So you have Lewis Winthorpe III, played by Dan Aykroyd. He's, he's born into privilege. He works for this commodities brokerage. Every, his life is perfect. You have Eddie Murphy, who plays Billy Ray Valentine, very smart guy, um, runs some cons on the street, as we see at the beginning uh, of the movie, but he's super smart. And so the brothers who run the commodities brokerage, uh, they decide that Randolph and Mortimer, hey, what if we do a bet for a dollar, a dollar? These guys are so wealthy, and but they just, they look at people as just to be interchanged however they want. What if we created in a situation where Lewis is on the street and we grab somebody who was on the street, put him into Lewis's position. Would they actually trade places and would they become, you know, would they, would, would Lewis try to just survive on the streets and would this person, this other person they pull from the streets, would they be able to do Lewis's job? Well, so they do this and Lewis ends up on the streets. That's where he meets Jamie Lee Curtis who helps him out um, and helps him survive. And uh, Billy Ray ends up at the commodities brokerage. Now we all saw how smart Billy Ray is. We know he can do this job. The audience knows it. The audience knows how smart he is, but he's not so sure. So his first day at this big commodities brokerage, he's looking up at this massive building. He's, you know, well-dressed looking up at this massive building. And he says to Coleman, the Butler, what if I can't do this job? What if I'm not what they expected? And mm. Coleman says, just be yourself, sir. They can't take that away from you. Now, oh. if that was the only lesson we learned, just be yourself. That's a great one. But there's something deeper going on here. We can see that Billy Ray can do this job. He can't. He can't see it. He's got a bit of what we call imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I talk about here is the idea of like that confident people question themselves. Arrogant people question others. And you Very see nice. him, right? Yeah. I mean, you <laughs> see him. He's, he's questioning himself. Why me? Yeah. What if I can't do this job? That's what confident people do. You're mm -hmm. only going to get better at what you do by continually questioning yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that and, and progress, yeah. forward movement, improvement. Yeah, right. And you can only improve if you question yourself. Because yeah. where do you go if you're not questioning yourself? If something goes wrong, you start pointing fingers at everybody. Oh, well, it can't possibly be my fault. And right. that's where the arrogant people question others. They make yeah. excuses for the things that are going on in their life or their work rather than looking in inwardly and saying, what, what is it that I can do uh, to be better? And, right. and then, of course, when you get into your role, realize that you're there for a reason. You're there because you deserve it, because you earned it. And I think the more imposter syndrome yeah. you have, this idea of why me, the more you've earned that position. 
The mm. person who walks in says, of course me. I'm not so sure that that's the person who's earned it. I think it's more the person who says, why me? Uh, yeah. And that's what he was doing. He teaches us a really valuable lesson between confidence and arrogance, the difference. Yeah. Well, that ought to make a lot of people feel pretty good. I, I suspect. I think those are really great messages, really wonderful ways to look at it. You know, when, because it's, it's so easy to be so narrowed in on the task, the thing, the dream, and, and it's difficult to, to get that bigger picture. So thank you so much for giving us some different ways to look at it. Are you ready to take control of your ride to wellness? Rev up with Driven Living. Visit www.drivenliving.com and buckle up for a journey. Get exclusive access to our Wellness Driven Life Show guest portal, where you can dive deep into the minds of our esteemed guests. Sign up for our newsletter and get insider scoops on these distinguished personalities. It's like having a backstage pass to their life-changing wisdom. But that's not all. You'll also receive a free hug. You heard me right, a free hug. An enlightening ebook from the Driven Living team. Discover the science-backed benefits of hugging yourself. It's a fill-up for your wellness tank. Because at Driven Living, we believe in fueling your journey to wellness, both physically and psychologically. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.drivenliving.com today. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want some more or are we... Uh... No, I want to show a couple of pictures that you have, Chris. Okay. Because you have, um, through this venture that you've done yeah. in the 80s pop culture, you've gotten to meet a lot of fun people. So let's bring in some of the photographs that yeah. you have. Yeah. So the top photo there. So, uh, what happened here in this situation was in 2019, I was asked to come out and speak at a eighties pop culture event in, called nostalgia con in Anaheim, California. And so I went out, I was to present, uh, as one of the speakers, there were, uh, all of the eighties people that I grew up with. It was really, really cool. Now Anaheim and LA being what it is, uh, there was traffic issues and a moderator wasn't going to make it. Um, for a couple of the panels and they, and the guy who was running the convention said, Hey, do you want to moderate a couple panels for us? I said, sure. So the first one was the MTV VJ, MTV VJ reunion panel that you see at the top there. And you'll see Nina Blackwood and Mark Goodman and Alan Hunter. If you're familiar with those names in terms of MTV VJs. And then the other guy in the crazy outfit, his name is poor man. He's like a iconic <laughs> LA uh, DJ and a super guy. He was the one who was actually running late for the moderating. And so I got to moderate the panel, which was really cool. This, we took this great picture at the end. Uh, then I was asked to moderate a Goonies reunion panel that included Sean Astin and Corey Feldman. You can see in that picture there as well. Uh, yeah. They couldn't be that both guys just cared so much about the audience and the people. I mean, obviously they couldn't be more different. You know, Sean Astin looks like he could be <laughs> like your neighbor next door. Corey Feldman does not. Um, uh, but, uh, but really engaged with all the people. And then the third one, uh, third picture there, for those of you that are younger, uh, you may recognize him from Stranger Things. He played the mayor of, uh, I can't remember which town he played the mayor of in season three, um, or season two or season three. But he's Carrie Ewells, and he was Wesley, uh, the man in black in The Princess Bride, yeah. which is where from a lot, I mean, he's had an incredible career, but that's where yeah. a lot of people know know him from The Princess Bride. Yeah. And he's definitely still going. He's still, he's still going hundred percent. Yeah. Really yeah. nice guy too. Yep. Cool. The blues brothers. So uh, great, great story here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had a chance That's to meet a great them. picture. Oh, it was awesome. I mean, listen, I, so, you know, you have Jim Belushi, obviously not John, Jim Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. Now Dan Aykroyd is one of my favorite comedic actors of all time. Oh yeah. And How could he not be? I love him. I mean, sorry, I need a sip of water there. Um, I will tell you that throughout my life, I always thought about what would I say if I met Dan Aykroyd? Mm. What line would I pull? 
And I, d- I had decided on a line that I thought would be different than what anybody else might do with him. And so one of my favorite movies from the eighties comedies, that's so underrated is spies like us uh, with Chevy chase and Dan Aykroyd. It's if you haven't seen it, it's, and it holds up. Okay. So this is one of those that was not problematic. It's, it's a great movie, great comedy. And at one point, uh, they're meeting these uh, doctors. They're they're pretending impersonating their doctors, and they meet these doctors, and they go through this whole line: doctor, 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 <laughs> doctor, doctor, doctor. And they were shaking hands as they said it. And so I walked up to him, shook his hand, I said, "Doctor," and he had the glasses on. He got this little smirk, and he uh-huh. nodded and said, "Doctor." And then it was just it was a great moment for me because I I feel confident that he probably didn't get that line very often. People probably went to other places to pull uh lines for for him especially like you know ghostbusters for example of course or maybe even some of his saturday night live stuff um so that was a lot of fun for me oh that that is cool i like that you use that that's brilliant yeah it was brilliant great 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 photo and then this guy um now you may not recognize him but if you are a fan of 80s metal 80s rock uh that is don dockin um from the band dockin and so I had a chance to meet him as well because we had some bands at that nostalgia con and a guy that I was with happened to be um, somebody who has been on the LA music scene for years. And I said, I'd love to meet him. And he said, no problem. Let me just grab him. He's, he's a, he's a super guy. He's a super nice guy. And he really was. And Dokken is another one of those underrated uh, bands from the eighties. And I, I encourage you to go back and listen to the music. His voice I mean, still, he still yeah. sounds just like he did in the 80s. Oh, wow. Very underrated all around music. His voice is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I And it's very impressive to have a voice, you know, especially the the rock uh, and metal era of the 80s, to have your voice still after that many years of just really utilizing yeah. it, oftentimes brutally, is <laughs> <laughs> right. pretty awesome. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, Chris, I'm going to have to know the next time there's one of these events because I, I I would love to be in the room. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I, I, this was so much fun for me. I met so many cool people. It was a great experience. And, uh, and then, you know, when I did my speaking, uh, gig up in one of the rooms, I had, I had a hundred people in the room and there was like basically people standing. It was really awesome. And people told me afterwards, they love seeing all of the celebrities as I, as I did, you know, the people that they grew up with, the posters they had on their wall, whether you were a guy or a girl, you had posters on your wall and all those people that were on your wall were at this, at this nostalgia con. Uh, but what they told me was it was cool to see somebody who was making a living at it, who yeah. wasn't, you know, doing that in the eighties was actually growing up in the eighties. And so I think I was able to hopefully connect and be a little more relatable uh, because look, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yeah, absolutely. And is this photo, this, is this different than the one we saw? No, that was the same one. That's just the, yeah. that's just the, the photo by itself. Well, the nicer close up of that outfit. I gotta say. Very nice. So now Chris, you have something that you put proceeds to. So I want to shed some light on that yeah. because it's a really cool thing. And so before I, I dive into the next photo, why don't we talk a little bit more about that? Because this is something that's really passionate and heartfelt. And I would love for you to talk about it. Yeah. So I grew up in a family that was always a huge advocate of animal rescue particularly dogs, but you know, animal rescue in general, my grandmother back in the forties and fifties was doing it before it was even a thing. And so it's just kind of inherent in all of us. Uh, I, um, I talk about dead poet society for this lesson about advocacy and most people from the movie dead poet society, they know the seize the day and uh, carpe diem. And if you don't know the movie, uh, Robin Williams plays a teacher named John Keating. I think it's probably set in the late 50s, uh, early 60s. He he works at an elite boarding school where these kids are all taught, like, you're going to be exactly what the family wants you to be, an accountant, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever. You don't stray. And you certainly don't go into the creative arts. Mm. And so John Keating says, nonsense, boys. You can be whoever you want to be. And at one point, he says to them, no matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. 
Mm. And that really resonated with me because back in the eighties, if I wanted my words out to the world, I had my community times newspaper in my little town and maybe 30 people read it now in the palm of our hand, we all have this thing, right? Yeah. And it, it's the great equalizer. You don't have to be an athlete, a politician, a world leader, a celebrity to get your words and ideas out to the world. You can do it right now in the palm of your hand. You can get those words and ideas out. That's talking the talk. You also have to walk the walk. What are you going to advocate for? And for me, it's mm. animal rescue. I donate a portion of the proceeds from my book sales and speaking gigs to Wonder Paul's Rescue, the rescue that saved my Bodhi boy, who we're going to talk about. And that that idea of walking the walk, um, what are you going to do? What are you going to advocate for? And so I, you know, the story of Bodhi is that I saw a picture of him. He was basically dead on the sidewalk in Miami. Uh, three months old, he was paralyzed. He couldn't go to the bathroom. He had bugs all over him. Mm -hmm. And a couple of cops uh, found him and they scooped him up and they took him to Wonder Paul's rescue. And I called the person who ran the rescue because I knew her. And I said, that's my guy. And she said, we don't even know if he's going to make it. He's, he's the worst case we've ever had. And I just, I had this connection with him. Mm -hmm. And about a month after he was at the vet, he actually got up and walked. And I saw this video of him standing up to walk after a month and his legs fell out from under him and he's still wagging his tail and he got up and tried again and then he went through another month of different things that were going on. He went into a foster and, and I ended up getting him at six months old. Um, now, what's important about this story? Yeah, that's that's he and I. Now, what's important about this story is when he came into my life. So August of 2020 is when I got him. And I didn't know that seven months down the road, my life was going to change um, drastically and quickly. And so in March of 2021, um, my, my girlfriend had been dating for about a year and a half. Uh, she got an RV and she left. She went cross country. Now at first you might say, Oh my God. But when we met, she still had some journeys that she needed to go through. And we were very clear about all of that. And I was totally supportive. One thing that I will never do ever, 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 ever is get in front of somebody's life journey. Uh, mm. I think it's really important to, I mean, everybody, I have one. That's a right? good message, you, Chris. Yeah. yeah. You have one. It's important to understand that sometimes the journey is not going to go the way that you want it to. And yeah. if it involves somebody else and they've got a, just a path they need to take, be open to that, please, mm -hmm. because it's really important. And I knew that. And so, yeah. I, of well, course, I, if I could interject real quick, it reminds yeah. me of when, like, uh, what is that term that saying? If, if it's love, uh, it somebody, will come back, yeah. set it free and yeah. it will. Yeah. 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 And sometimes it's still love and, you know, they don't come back and that's okay. And yeah. I mean, that that's, you have to accept that everybody has their own journey and she had hers and, and I couldn't be happier for her. She's in a great place now and I'm super happy for her. Um, I think she's exactly where she needs to be, but that was still hard on me. You know, March of 2021, I watch her drive away in an RV. Yeah. Uh, two weeks later, we get the news that my stepmom, who had been in my life for 40 years, not like a, you know, a two year stepmom or anything was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, uh, and died three weeks later, came out of nowhere and she was gone within three weeks. Yeah. And then that, so that was April of 2021. And then in July of 2021, my mom passed away from Alzheimer's. So wow. in a 90 day period, my life was like a country song. I mean, yeah, well, and all, you know, greatly the, your, your feminine, resources like yeah. all, all, all emails, yeah. your, yeah. your love your mothers yeah wow i'm so sorry for those losses and absolutely that would be a, a big hit it was crazy and i i mean i still have my sister who's awesome we're best friends but the but you know yes i mean these three very important people in my life were gone uh and not not coming back and so two of them mm -hmm. you know really not coming back one i i, I you know i figured probably wasn't going to uh, but all along I had Bodie boy, I had my rock and, um, mm. you know, when my mom was passing away, I live in Florida, she was in Baltimore and I was going to spend a few weeks up there and I decided to drive up with Bodie. That was the picture you see there of he and I in the car, we were driving up together, 16 hour drive, um, which listen, I love my dog to death, but when you're driving 16 hours and you're no one, no one to talk to, it's, it's weird. Um, so I, we got up there and the first thing he did was go to my mom's side. Uh, she was in hot in home hospice at that time, laying in bed and he just put his head right on her hand and, mm. um, and he knew. And so that was a really important moment for me. I'm glad we got to do that. 
but I, I say, you know, you have to, especially for somebody like me who doesn't have kids, like I'm putting these footprints in the sand and there aren't going to be these little footprints that come behind me. So I've got to create those. Like, what is that legacy going to be? What are those footprints going to be that come behind me? And for me, it's animal rescue. And I say that rescue is the best breed. Um, you know, please adopt, don't shop, especially right now. There are so many dogs and cats that need a home and we're euthanizing them by the hundreds of thousands in shelters. Yeah. Um, and these are great dogs and great cats. Uh, please, if you have it, if you have space in your home, adopt, don't shop. Oh, well, you're tearing at my little heartstrings, Chris. <laughs> Gosh. Well, I have in the description um, below, for those of you who watch this, watch the replay, I do have a link to the Wonder Paws Rescue. It is located in Florida. However, you can still donate to them. They accept it from anywhere. I am sure of it. Yep. So <laughs> I wanted yes. to make sure that I linked that in for you, Chris, because I know that this is something that's immensely important to you, that you're very passionate about it. And it's a beautiful thing. And it's such a beautiful story. And if you want to go into another one real quick about an experience with, you know, fighting, those things still happen where there's a lot of abuse that is going on that people don't really think about because why would you want to first off? But it's, it's not the greatest thing to know about, hear about, but there are people who are advocating for the ceasing of it. Can you want to shed some light a little bit on that? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, dog fighting is a horrible thing that is still happening all over the country. It's awful. It's horrific. It's despicable and it's happening everywhere. And, uh, my most recent, um, interaction with, uh, a dog from there was uh, about a month ago. I was just scrolling through next door, the next door app we all have, you know, and I think if you have the next door app, you know, most of the time it's like, was that gunshots or fireworks or what is that helicopter doing in the sky? Right. I mean, it's like, does anybody know why the helicopter is in the sky? I mean, there's just, it's, it's pretty <laughs> right. Or this person's dog pooped on my lawn. Like it's, it's just, yeah, yeah. That's, but every so often you come across something where you can help. And so I saw this picture. This girl said, I, I it's nine o'clock at night. I saw this dog laying on the side of the road, open my door. He jumps right in. She snaps a picture. He clearly has um, bite wounds on him, fresh mm -hmm. and scars. Uh, and I knew immediately that he'd been used as a bait dog. Bait dogs, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, when the dog refuses to fight, they throw him into the other, to, into, the, into a, 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 a place where the dogs do fight so that those dogs can practice on tearing a dog apart. This, this is how horrific this is. He somehow must have escaped. I don't know how, but he did. And so he's in this girl's car and she says, I don't know what to do. It's nine o'clock at night. I have dogs at home. I can't bring him home, but I cannot leave him. So this is the power of uh, social media. This is where social media can be for good. Uh, a, an older German lady said, I live near where you are. I'll come get him and take him in for the night and I'll take him to a rescue tomorrow. And she bathed him and cleaned up his wounds and he slept. And then the next morning she got up, called the rescue. The rescue was full till September 13th. Again, adopt, don't shop. There's so many that need homes right now. Yeah. Uh, I have a connection with a, a small rescue called off the streets, bully rescue. They focus on um, bully breeds like Bodhi. And I reached out to them and I sent them the picture and they said, you know, we're, we're full as well, but we're going to find a way if you can, transport him halfway to Naples. We'll come the other half and grab him. Now, Naples, Florida for me is about two and a half hours. So an hour and 15 minutes of my day back and forth to save this guy. And so the German, the older German lady drives him down to meet me near my house, drops him to me. I drive him an hour and 15 minutes to a meeting point, give him to the, the rescue. The rescue takes him to Naples. He goes to a vet. Uh, he's got stitches, he's got antibiotics, but he is going to be fine. And he's going to be up for adoption probably in a few months. He still has some stuff he needs to go through. Uh, but that's the power of networking. That's the power of community. And, and for all the bad things that social media bring to the table, that is a positive thing that it can bring to the table. So, um, it, again, if you have the opportunity, you know, I know people volunteering, it takes time and I know people don't have a lot of it. 
but something simple that you can do is just be a little leg for transport for a rescue. Sometimes all they need is 30 minutes. Can you take this dog 30 minutes from here to this person? Because then they can take that, that dog for an hour and then they're going to drop them off to somebody else who takes them for another hour to get them to the rescue. This is how that works. Yeah. And, That's um, a great, great example. And so thank you so much for shedding some light on that and sharing that. And so again, that information is in the description. I want to make sure people know where to find out more about you and find your awesome books and book you as a speaker, because I mean, what a fun way to get some awesome life lessons and things for, you know, building your culture in your company. So the website is www.chrisclues.com. And that is also in the description. And Chris, it has been so great to have you on the Wellness Driven Life Show today. Is there anything else that you want to share with the audience? Yeah, I think uh, one other thing that I wanted to say is we talked about the Breakfast Club a little bit. There's some great lessons about individuality in the Breakfast Club. And one of the most important ones to me is Brian the Brain, played by Anthony Michael Hall. And, you know, we talk about don't judge a book by its cover. He, he's not supposed to be in detention. He's the brain. How could he end up in detention? Uh, and we see at the beginning that he's, you know, he's got this, uh, I don't know, he's like um, uh, a little introverted, but he comes out of his shell and we see the real Brian throughout the movie. And I think one of the important lessons in there is that just like the ocean, the really cool stuff in people is beneath the surface. And so always remember that when you run into somebody, the really cool stuff in people is beneath the surface. Uh, uh, and so yeah. uh, I would say that. And also like, yes, if you are looking for a keynote speaker, that's fun and unique, and you can also theme a really cool 80s theme around this. We can work together on how to do that. There's multiple ways we can do it. Uh, I'm your guy. And um, I would love to do that for you. And you can find my books on Amazon. Absolutely. Chris, you are so awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show on this platform it was a joy for me to talk about this subject and to bring in other things that we don't oftentimes bring in on the show. So thank you again so much for being on the show. And I want to say again to the audience, check his stuff out. He's really fun. And I know his books are too. So goodbye for now. And we will see you later. Stay rad, everybody. <laughs>